I'm an engineer. Oh, God, I, I, I'm an engineer. Oh, I am an engineer. I am an engineer. I, I, I am an engineer. I, I am an engineer. I am an engineer. I am an engineer. I, I, I am an engineer. I, I really am an engineer. I am an engineer. I am an engineer. <laughs> <laughs> But seriously, I am an engineer. <laughs> so why do young women not want to go into engineering? Now that's a question that I had been trying to answer for several years, until in 2005, I was asked to be part of a research study. We talked to 3,000 girls across the country, highly proficient in math, but didn't want to pursue engineering. And when we asked them why they didn't want to pursue engineering, the number one response was, oh my god, do I look like a geek? <sighs> <laughs> but it was the second response that really shocked me. They said, I want a job that helps people. Really? I was stunned. You see, as an engineer, I feel so alive. And at the time of the research, I'd been an engineer for 25 years. And throughout that time, every morning I would wake up and I was so excited, knowing that I could use my art skills to draw, I could use my creativity to solve problems, and I knew in my heart that the projects that I was working on was improving the quality of life for lots of people. At that moment, I was committed to fix the perception problem. But the problem actually is a lot bigger than that. It's not that we just need more women engineers. We need more engineers, period. The world is facing massive challenges. The National Science Foundation recently released a report indicating the world's grand challenges. Access to clean water, economical energy sources, such as solar and fusion as we face peak oil production. The urgent need to repair and restore our rapidly decaying infrastructure and rapid climate change. And that's just to name a few. So who in this world is in the best position to tackle these grand challenges? Engineers. But despite these daunting challenges and the tremendous need, the fact is we are facing a serious shortage of engineers. Reuters reported last month that the shortage of engineers and sanitation experts is seriously undermining the effort to halt the outbreak of Ebola in West Africa. And the Financial Times reported earlier this year that the shortage of engineers is threatening the UK's economic recovery. And the United States Air Force just announced that the number of engineers and scientists retiring from the United States Air Force has doubled in the last five years. No one to replace them. So why don't students want to go into engineering? Well, believe it or not, two of the largest barriers preventing the building of a pipeline of new engineers, public perception, and the media. The public can't see past the brains of an engineer. The public doesn't equate our profession with socially aware, compassionate individuals and ideas, the humanness of engineering has been lost. And when we size up the world's problems that need engineering solutions and acknowledge the fact that we don't have enough engineers to tackle these issues, well, that's a big problem for engineers and the world. And the public also doesn't appreciate the fact that engineers make some pretty darn good leaders. For example, what do the CEOs of Walmart, General Motors, Ford Motor Company, AT&T, IBM, Johnson & Johnson, and Amazon have in common with the CEOs of a few other little small companies called Apple, Google, <laughs> Facebook, Microsoft, and Yahoo? They all have engineering degrees. Yep. According to Business Insider, 33% of all the S&P CEOs are engineers. 
Being an engineer is not mutually exclusive with being a leader. Yet, in January of this year, according to a survey, only 9% of the public surveyed even thought that an engineer would even make a good CEO. The media is powerful and can change the perception of what an engineer looks like and what an engineer does. Look at the field of forensic science. Nobody knew what forensic science was. People weren't going into universities to get a degree in forensics until that little show called CSI came along <laughs> and changed all of that. Gave forensic science some cachet, some intrigue, some excitement. And now universities are filled with eager freshmen wanting to study forensic science. So imagine engineers using their athletic abilities to scale mountains, cross rapids, <laughs> do the impossible. And imagine engineers going to cities and towns and remote villages to help people rebuild their communities after they've been ravaged by war or weather disasters. Or imagine yet engineers going, what if, to big questions like, will our planet have enough oxygen, enough water, too much carbon dioxide? Engineers get to do some pretty cool things. They get to do research, and not just research on how to improve the quality of our life, but to do research to determine whether or not we're actually going to live and not die. I had the great opportunity when I was on the National Science Board to go to the South Pole. Now that was cool. I mean really cool. <laughs> I mean minus 57 degrees cool. <laughs> but seriously, the air at the South Pole is the purest on Earth. And the research that we are doing down there is to determine how carbon dioxide is actually going to affect the air quality, and to determine how to improve the air that we breathe. How much carbon dioxide can the air have before we can no longer breathe? Important questions to get answers to, especially critical in this case, because if we're not breathing, well, yeah, that's a problem. <laughs> so with all the negative perceptions out there about engineers, one might ask the question, why did I become an engineer? Well, I almost didn't. I wanted to be an interpreter, a lawyer, an interior designer, because I loved art. Until that fateful day at my high school, when I was asked to attend a career day on engineering. Boring. I mean, I was artistic. I was creative. I was a people person not an engineer. So I sat on the very back row, preparing to take a nap, went up on stage. The presenter, an engineer, had the most amazing drawings of buildings. And I'd love to draw. And I'd love to draw buildings. He had my attention. And when he affirmed that I could have art and creativity in my job, I was sold. So I bet you're thinking that my next line's going to be, and she lived happily ever after. <laughs> That's not what happened. <laughs> my two trusted advisors, my guidance counselor and my math teacher, they discouraged me from going to engineering. They said it was a bad idea. I'd flunk out. I didn't have the aptitude. I wasn't smart enough to be an engineer. And then my grandmother, who I adored, gave me the final blow. She said, isn't engineering a man's job? <laughs> but you know, actually, I'm so grateful for those discouragements because they made me even more determined. I love being an engineer. And I realize, though, that there are folks out there that are facing the same issues that I did, and they don't and won't study engineering. I need to be that guy that came to my high school and changed my life. I need to be the one that goes to students to tell them what engineering 
really is. I need to rehumanize engineering. But how? Well, there's a website called Engineer Girl developed by the National Academy of Engineering, and I love being a part of it. Engineer Girl helps girls take that leap to go in and study engineering. They help girls chat with other professional women engineers and to be able to ask them questions such as going into college, finding a job, work-life balance, just about anything that's on their mind. But mostly, it allows girls to see whether they can connect with us real engineers and ask us questions like, why did you decide to become an engineer? And secondly, they really are trying to determine whether they can actually fit in, survive, thrive in a man's world. And I love telling them stories about how women engineers can do the impossible, including a story about Emily Roebling, a self-trained engineer who in the 1870s led the construction of the Brooklyn Bridge after her husband was injured on the job site. And remember that geek status given to us engineers? I also tell those young ladies, I have wear heels to work 85% of the time. <laughs> and I've never worn a pocket protector. <laughs> so what can you do to help? Well, we need people to step up and speak out. We need to tell more stories. We need to tell stories about what engineering really is. And whether that's on the TV, whether it's in the movies, where it's in the press, about the big problems that engineers solve. The people we help and the world we make better. If we could rehumanize engineering, change our image, we can change our future and make this world a better place for all of us. And so someday, I hope, when someone asks you, you can proudly now say that you or someone you know is an engineer. Thank you.